All right. Well, thanks for joining us today on our Dairy Goat webinar series. My name is Jennifer Bentley, and I'm a dairy field specialist with Iowa State University Extension and Outreach as a dairy educator. And I welcome you to our, our Dairy Goat webinar series. I also have on the Zoom call here today my colleague in Northwest Iowa, Fred Hall. So he's going to help uh, facilitate the program here as we get started. Just a couple housekeeping things um, as you're logging on here, just making sure you keep your mute, your microphones muted as the presentation is going. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and put those into the chat box and we'll address those um, at the end of the presentation and, and make sure um, we get those questions answered. We will also be recording this, so um, it will be available later. Uh, on our YouTube channel, and I'll do a follow-up email with all our registrations here so that you have the direct link to this webinar, uh, but our previous webinars are also hosted on that YouTube channel. Um, so also we'll have a, an evaluation here that I'll put in the chat, chat box towards the end of the presentation. If people wouldn't mind filling that out um, before they log off here today, that just helps us with our upcoming Dairy Goat pro programming as we continue this series. Um, We'll have one more webinar here this spring coming up on May 22nd. And our topic there is gonna be biosecurity, preparing for shows and keeping animals healthy. And that's gonna be with Rachel Friedrich with Iowa State University College of Veterinary Medicine. And then we'll take the summer off. So we won't be meeting in June, July and August and we'll be back in September, but I'll do some follow up emails with people after that. So with today's topic, we are gonna be focusing on using functional type assessments to improve milk quality. And our presenter here today is Danny Louie. Danny grew up in Northern California and was the fifth generation to be born and raised on his cattle's, family's cattle ranch. He graduated with honors from Chico State University in 2010 with a degree in agriculture and an emphasis on animal science. Danny is employed with American Dairy Goat Association as a linear appraiser and owns his own semen processing company, Excel Genetics, along with being a herd owner of Blissberry Nubians. Danny resides in Alexandria, Minnesota. So we welcome to him to our webinar series here. And we were fortunate to have Danny in Iowa here uh, a couple months ago, giving a presentation in person to our Iowa producers. So fortunate to have you back on here. And with that, I'll let you take it over, Danny. All right, thank you. So, and thank you guys all for joining today. Um, when Jennifer and I were uh, trying to come up with a date to have this work, um, we were planning around kittens and all of that, and so far that went well. The one person we forgot to consult was obviously Taylor Swift, and she had big plans for today. <laughs> so um, I'll try to keep it as short as possible so we can get back to this to, <laughs> to her new album. Um, but today we're going to talk about um, types influence on um, production quality and just finding the right type of um, dairy goat to... Um, to um, get you that, that result there. Let's see if we can get this to go to the next slide. There it goes. Mm -hmm. um, so like Jennifer said, I was born and raised in um, Northern California. It was on a cattle ranch. Um, the goat endeavor started with, I had begged and pleaded my parents to buy me a dairy cow um, and they did. Um, I milked her for a little while and decided there really has to be something easier to milk than um, a cow. And that brought me to dairy goats. Um, I started, if you over here um, with crossbreds, they were um, Nubian Oberhasli crosses, um, then later went into um, full American Oberhasli um, and then some Sonnens. In 2012, I moved to uh, Blissberry Dairy Goat where we um, kind of combined forces. We now breed um, Nubians and Sonnens. The Oberhasleys have kind of gone by the wayside. We do still have one that um, resides here. She's no longer bred though, just a retired doe in the back barn. Um, we are a seed stock producer. The main way we showcase our genetics is um, through um, show. We try to get to the national show as often as we can. We also um, utilize production testing um, as well as type um, evaluation with the LA program through the American Dairy Goat Association. That's really what we have credited a lot of our um, successes to. 
none of us in our group um, were born into dairy goats. It was all um, having to learn after the fact. And that program had been um, really important and influential to us in the development um, and our overall skill set. In 2018, I started working for um, the American Dairy Goat Association in the um, linear appraisal um, program. It's kind of um, kind of a passion of mine. So that's where I have um, started giving my energy. Today, um, what we're gonna basically talk about is we're gonna go into, um, dive into the ADGA scorecard overall, um, just kind of breaking it down, talking about what um, we're describing there into that scorecard. So just a little bit about the general type and selection. Um, then we're gonna dive into um, the rump and rear leg influence on the mammary quality. And then the mammary um, quality that has influence there on the overall um, milk quality. So just basically how the uh, correct structure can lend itself to giving you not only more production, um, but a higher quality product in the end. This is the um, ADGA scorecard. Um, if we notice on this ADGA scorecard, it is broken down into four major um, categories. The first one being the general appearance. Um, that's worth 35 points of the 100 on the scorecard. The mammary system is the other large point category here on that scorecard being 35 um, points as well. After that, it's followed up by the dairy strength being 20% and then body capacity making up that last 10% of the overall scorecard here. The goal of this um, unified scorecard, it is to aid in the selection of dairy goats that can function efficiently over a long and productive life. Um, that comes into play as being fairly important in the dairy industry. Um, you get your replacements grown up, you have all the feed costs, the dry time spent on them. Once you get them into production, you want to be able to keep them in production um, year after year after year. So the scorecard is to help select animals that can perform efficiently over that long period of time. When we dive here into the first uh, major category, that general appearance, um, the description here that we have for that general appearance is an attractive framework with femininity, strength, upstandingness, length, smoothness of blending throughout that creates an impressive style and graceful walk. So we already see here, as we're starting to talk about the general appearance, how walking becomes um, important. We want them to have that um, graceful carriage that style, the ability to walk around. Um, one of the, the major important things for an animal to be productive is her ability to function and um, walk around. When we start breaking down the overall general appearance, the first category um, that we get to in that general appearance is head and breed character. It is worth five points of the 35 points. Um, if we notice, it does also um, have breed character combined with the head. But when we start thinking about breed character, that's when we're talking about how tall the animal is at the withers, um, the color um, patterns of the animals, the ears, the nose, um, just basically describing the characteristics of that breed. When we think about that and the overall stance of the functionality of a goat, we have to recognize the, the breed um, standard, though it's important for the look of the breed, it's not as important to the overall functionality of the animal. Um, so we can't really justify giving a ton of points to breed characteristics when they don't really play an overall role there um, in the function and productivity of the actual dairy animal. Um, where we're gonna see most of these points being allocated is just more to the overall function um, of the head. When we're looking at the head, we would ideally see them um, having what we call a balanced head. And by balance, what we're talking about is we wanna see that overall width of that head, um, balancing with the length of that head, along with the depth of that head here um, from up at the top of the pole down into that jaw. Ideally, you would see those lengths balancing out. That's what we would consider an animal having a fairly balanced head. When we look down here at the muzzle, we're wanting to see a nice strong jaw. We wanna see open nostrils. The ability to have that animal 
um, get air into those lungs, keeping the organs happy, as well as when we talk about the function there of the jaw, we want them to be able to chew their food um, efficiently, effectively, not have any pain or relation to that, um, where you can start to decrease your overall productivity if it's not really comfortable for that animal um, to get food there into their system. And then lastly, we talked a little bit about the overall expression, the alertness there into the um, eyes, the sculpting there about the eyes. Um, again, can give you kind of the overall health and well-being there of the animal. Uh, but just recognizing the bulk of these points coming down to the actual functionality there of the head. When we dive into the shoulder assembly, um, again, it's a five-point category. Um, recognizing uh, that this scorecard is all intertwined. Each um, part has a role. Um, this front end assembly heavily affects um, the use of the front legs as well as the back. So recognizing that it is five points um, standalone on its own, um, but when you're starting to have um, function issues, you're gonna also see that come out in the legs and the back. So the main um, parts here on this shoulder assembly is it does kind of start to set the stage here for the overall animal. It helps lend itself to the overall shape. We traditionally get very hung up here um, because we can see it fairly easy, but the top of this shoulder assembly, where we're talking about how sharp she is here into those overall withers, um, how tight she is there into those overall crops. Um, we do look at that. We want to see an animal that is um, more narrow at the top of the shoulder, gaining depth and width into that chest. If we look at her from the front view, we would start to see what we call an A shape here, being more narrow at the top, gaining width there into the bottom. And when we start looking at the overall function and the point value, more of that is going to be assigned down here at the bottom of this shoulder assembly. And that's where a lot of the function starts to come in. We're looking for that animal to have some depth here into that chest floor, and we want to see moderate extension here into that chest floor. We also want to see um, a leg that is placed directly under that high point of the withers. That's where you're going to um, start to gain the overall support of those front legs, as well as give support to the back. We're having the um, tendency right now in dairy goats to see that front leg start to shift forward. If you imagine this front leg starting to come forward a little bit there onto that goat, we're gonna artificially see at the top of that shoulder, her looking sharper at the point of the withers, more smooth at the point of the withers, um, just when you first glance as she starts to pick up some of that overall neck, it gains height there into that withers. However, what we start to see fall apart when we see that trend is down here at the bottom of the shoulders. If we picture this leg starting to move forward here onto this chest, we're gonna start to see her not be able to use her legs as well. Um, as they start to fold around there, cuts off the chest, you're gonna start to see her opening up here at the elbows as well as start to open up a little bit um, there into the crops. We also important to recognize here into that shoulder assembly that this leg um, joint meeting with the shoulder assembly, there is no bone structure holding this front leg onto the body. It's all done with muscles and tendons. So it's important um, that we keep that in mind here that when we start to mess with where that leg um, placement is, we start to stretch out some of our tendons, some of our muscles there, um, and doesn't have the overall support and longevity there um, that you would get when you have that more correct leg placement there. When we start talking about the back, again, you're talking about that being a um, five point category on our scorecard. Um, we're looking for it to be strong and straight with well-defined um, vertebrae, taller at the withers than the hips, um, level chine, full crops, wide loin, and wide hips. So when we're starting to look at that, um, we naturally in side profile um, look to see that it is more uphill here, being more level. We're not getting the dip um, there into the chine or the roach there into the loin. We also want to look for um, the balance of it where we would ideally see her, um, you can see the lines drawn here above it, we wanna see her balancing the length of that um, loin and chine. 
we also, the underappreciated um, view of this bat is over the top. We also want to take a look at it, not just inside profile, but from the top. That's where we're going to start to see some of the overall wedge shape coming in here as we move from the front of the animal down the back. We should be seeing them increase in width here as we come into these hip bones. That's going to start to give the overall shape. It also starts to give the overall support here into the barrel um, of that animal. I also again want to point out that um, here right into the scorecard we're talking about defined vertebrae. We're talking about we should be able to see the vertebrae here on the back. Again, that lends itself to talking about animals um, that are appropriate weight. Um, as we start to um, see animals that gain a bunch of weight, you're gonna start to see those vertebrae disappear. So we actually are supposed to be able to see these bone um, structures on these animals um, when we are evaluating them. When we get into the rump, the rump is um, very similar to the shoulder assembly and that it has a lot of roles. It has a lot of um, cause and effect, especially there onto the rear legs and the overall health of the mammary system. We're gonna dive into some of the cause and effects um, more as we get into the presentation, um, but just more general about the rump um, is that we're looking for what we call a strong rump. We evaluated again also inside profile, looking to see how level it is um, from hips to pins. We want to be careful there not to develop too much um, level. There is such thing as too level of a rump. That's when you're going to start to see um, this line level out across or even in some cases start to um, go more uphill here. That's going to lend itself to a whole host of problems. When um, you think about the overall function of the rump, it's not just to house the mammary system there, um, but it is where you're going to have your kiddings um, coming out. It is also important that um, we have that overall angle at kidding time for the kids, these of the kids to come out, but as well as drainage um, from as that uterus starts um, to go back to its normal form, we want to have the ability for it to drain um, so that we don't start winding up with um, uterine infections, which can lead themselves um, to animals that don't want to necessarily breed back. When we start talking about the overall proportions, again, and levelness from thorough to thorough, we're talking about the top view here. Um, we're wanting to see um, animals where um, they, again, maintain or gain width as we move from those hip bones down to those thorough bones. We want to see these thorough bones placed about two-thirds the distance from the hip bones. Um, and about one third you would find the pin bones here from the thorough. So that's the overall proportion that we're looking for. We again don't want to start to see those high dorsals. Um, a lot of times we start to see those high dorsals um, when if we were to draw a line inside profile, we'd ideally see those um, the hip bones, the thoroughs coming in very close to that line going to those pin bones. As the thoroughs start to fall from that line, you're going to artificially see um, some of the levelness from thorough to thorough loss there. That's when we start to see the hip structure or the rump structure close off. Um, that's going to lend itself to um, issues again and where um, kids have a harder time getting out. We're losing some of the overall width there of the pelvis um, structure there. So important to kind of keep that um, overall um, mindset when evaluating your rumps, not just in that side profile view where you maintain some angle there, um, but also the proportions as we look over the top of that, um, that rump. And then again, um, we want to talk about um, degrees of fleshing. We are again are talking about um, animals where we're not getting a bunch of fat here built up on the tail. Um, we see right here with the tail symmetry to the body and freeness from coarseness there into that overall tail. So built into that scorecard, once again, I'm um, talking a little bit about the overall um, fleshing there of, of the animals. Now, um, this is kind of a broad category, but it's talking about legs, pasterns, and feet. Um, when we start breaking down um, this category, it's a 15-point category, so obviously um, carries a lot of the weight of a 35% um, scorecard. But again, we've got to talk about um, the functionality here. Where is the function? A large amount of the function comes down to the use of these legs. 
um, the front legs and those rear legs. When we're talking about the front legs, again, we've already talked about um, heavily reliant here on that shoulder assembly and their overall placement. We want to see them placed here under the high point of the withers. That um, also helps support the overall back. If you picture these front legs going forward, you'll um, automatically start to see those dips into that chine, which usually is counterbalanced with a roach into that overall loin, um, trying to support that. Whereas if you back up and get those legs placed correctly, gives more support to the overall animal there. We also want to see those front legs um, walking out smoothly here. We want to see um, width there. We want to see them tracking straight forward. When you look at them, you should see those legs coming straight forward without rotation. You don't want to see them closing off their overall stance. You want to be able to see them maintain that width that they have there into that chest in those front legs. We also start talking about the bone pattern here in those front legs. We want to see flat bone. Um, flat bone lends itself to animals that aren't able to muscle as well. Again, um, we're looking for animals that don't focus so much on their overall muscling um, as they do putting that effort into um, production. When we start talking about the rear legs, Again, here's some of the proportions that we would overall looking for here, coming there off of that, um, that pin bone down here and towards the flank down through the hock down to that lower leg. We're looking for that leg to be more proportioned. We wanna see in curving here into that overall thigh. Um, we ideally would see that leg um, coming almost perpendicular here. If you were to drop a plumb line here from that hip bones down through, that's where we would expect to see that, that leg in there. When we start looking from the rear, we wanna see good width here between those hocks. Um, that's gonna lend itself to that open, clean expression, giving room for that mammary system um, to go in there. Again, we wanna see that motion. We wanna see those um, legs able to freely move forward, track straight forward. We don't wanna see rotation into those legs. As we start to see rotation into those legs, you're gonna see that take a toll there onto the overall mammary system. So we just wanna keep that in mind. Um, as we're looking there into those legs. When we're thinking about those rear legs, um, we do need them to have that angulation, that flexibility. When we think about the life of the goat, uh, they need to be able to twice a day, um, some area or some milking systems three times a day, um, jump up and down off of that milk stand, coming in and out of the milk parlor in an efficient manner um, where they can do that year after year. Um, so angularity, plays a large role there into that. The um, other parts here that we talk about is the pasterns. We don't put a lot of emphasis here on the pasterns. Um, when we think about the role of the pasterns, they're heavily in, um, influenced with the environment. Um, things such as minerals can take effect on there, um, whether um, they've had their feet trimmed traveling, those kind of things all start to affect the overall health there of the pasterns. What we basically want there is a flexible pastern. Again, we need them to have the flexibility to jump up and down off of the milk stand. Um, and then obviously keeping them um, shorter bone pattern gives them a little bit more overall strength. When we talk about feet, that obviously um, has been a discussion for many years in dairy goats. When we start talking about a bone pattern, um, we are talking about um, sharp, open, angular, long bone patterns throughout. It's almost impossible to not have that bone pattern follow into the feet. So it's not uncommon um, when we start to see that bone pattern on really productive animals. They do have the tendency um, to not be quite as deep into that heel, being a little bit more open into that overall toe. Well, we wanna um, put the emphasis there on the feet is we want them to be functional. We want the foot to be able to support um, the leg there for many years again. Um, but basically there is a large degree of what a functional foot is there. So not being too hung up um, there on the overall foot and recognizing that when we're evaluating this category, um, the legs really start to come in, whether we're talking about the front or the back, uh, a large degree of that importance and functionality of the dairy goat um, comes into that. So keeping that in mind as we digest that 
uh, category. That finishes up the general appearance um, in a nutshell. The next um, category we're going to dive into is dairy strength. Um, that accounts for 20 points of our 100 points on um, the scorecard. It's defined by the scorecard as a long bone pattern throughout openness, angularity. Um, we want that substance um, of bone, but we want them to be free of coarseness and we want them to have evidence of milkability with regard to their um, stage of lactation. We obviously recognize earlier on into that lactation, we're gonna see more um, productivity in that mammary system um, as we are later there into that stack um, lactation. But we recognize that just with the normal um, lactation there on the dairy goats. When we start to look at this, um, I think the things that we really need to jump out here is um, having that substance, um, but we don't wanna get so strong into that substance that we also start getting coarseness. We're also, again, starting to talk about the flatness of bone again. Um, again, we're not looking for that round bone pattern. We want animals that are flat bone. That flat bone lends itself um, to animals that can focus more there on their productivity, not as easy for them to build that muscle um, where they start taking some of their resources and putting it towards muscle as opposed to um, milk production. We again, um, see just enough substance to support that um, functionality. We want to see them obviously um, excelling more in the dairy um, attribute of this. We want to see that long bone pattern, that uphillness. We want to see them in curving here at that thigh, clean open there into that flank. You're going to traditionally see this overall dairy wedge shape that we talk about um, not just here inside profile, but we would see that wedge shape that we touched on there in the overall back there. The ribbing should be open with that flat bone. They should start to angle back here towards that overall flank. There should be good space there between those overall ribs. We again want to see them sharp there into that um, angular or into that withers. And then um, the skin, we start talking about the skin should be pliable when we put our hands on it. Um, it's traditionally um, thin. You'll hear um, some people talk about how it feels like butter. Um, you can pull it there off of their body, um, just loose, um, pliable skin there into all of that um, dairiness. So I'm um, keeping that in mind in that overall um, dairiness. Um, definitely um, the structure that we talked about before you'll start to see relate here. Um, where correct structure helps give you the overall correct shape um, of that dairy goat. For body capacity, body capacity is the um, smallest point category there on our um, card. Again, it talks about 10% um, of it is our, our goes to body capacity. We want it large in proportion to the age, the period of um, lactation. It is broken down into two points. It's our chest and our barrel. Um, again, when we start talking about the chest, a lot of that is um, a redundant there with the overall shoulder assembly. Um, we're again looking for that deep, wide, yet clean cut. Um, then we wanna go into those four ribs. We want them full into the crops and at the point of elbow. And then into that barrel, again, we wanna look at that overall shape, not just in the um, side profile, but we um, want to see that again over the top. Um, and then again, when we're viewing them there from the front, that's where we're going to start to see some of these proportions coming in with their overall um, depth and width. Again, when we um, talk about the shoulder assembly setting the stage, this is kind of what we're talking about. If you're getting a um, fairly correct shoulder assembly on there, you're going to start to see the overall shape of that go um, follow suit. The other thing to recognize when we are talking about um, body capacity is um, the more length we add to um, a dairy goat, traditionally we're going to start to see them lose some of the depth. The more um, length you give up on that dairy goat, you traditionally start to pick up more depth. So just finding the overall balance there, um, again, recognizing one of the trends of the scorecard is when you start to pull in an extreme, um, you probably are going to give up some structural correctness in other areas. And this is an area of the scorecard where you start to see that um, come into play, where um, depth of body um, kind of goes hand in hand with length of body. So just finding that overall balance helps there.
when we also look at the wording here, um, we still see words um, like refined flame, um, clean cut, um, those kind of things that again indicate um, that we aren't just looking for a ton of weight to make up this body. The animal should be able to have the overall body shape and still be in a healthy body condition. Um, yet again, with this scorecard. And then recognizing just the overall proportions um, that we're looking for here in the dairy goat. Next, what we're gonna jump into is that mammary system. Um, again, for the mammary system, this is our next high point um, category. It's equal to the points there of the overall um, general appearance. So when we're talking about um, the general or the mammary system, we're talking about um, a strong attached mammary system being elastic, well-balanced with adequate capacity. Um, we're seeing the capacity start to jump in there again. We want it to have um, good qualities where it has ease of milking, um, and we want them to have that ability to have that um, milk production over a long period of time. When we um, start breaking down the mammary system, the first thing we're gonna talk about is the udder support. Um, what we're talking about here um, is having that strong overall medial. That's one of the strong support systems of that mammary system. It also is um, one of the traits that help um, support the mammary system, if we think of it um, as a rope coming here off of the pelvis all the way back um, to the um, fore udder, helps support, hold that whole mammary system up there. Again, um, we're looking um, for at the rear attachments as well as the fore udder attachments here on that overall mammary system. It helps give the overall shape. We Again, you can see the number of times capacity um, is um, supported here. We are looking for these mammary systems to be elastic where they can um, stretch, give that um, producing ability. When we start to talk about um, smooth attachments, um, we got to be careful there um, where we do want there to be smoothness into that attachment. Um, but we also have to make sure the smoothness we're talking about isn't a lack of capacity. If we think about um, really small, smooth udders um, that are small in their capacity, it doesn't really take a lot to hold those mammary systems onto that body. They easily give that smooth appearance. Um, so recognizing the overall shape that we're looking for here, we want there to be that support yet with that overall um, capacity. For um, the four outer, what we're looking for again, um, we're talking about the mammary system again from the teeth forward. Um, this ideally would make up about one third there of the um, overall mammary system. What's important here um, that jumps out at us is um, wide and full to the side, extending moderately forward without an excess of non-productive lactation tissue. Again, we're seeing the words capacity and productivity here. For a mammary system, um, when we're talking about the to really be productive, there has to be a good amount of width in that lateral attachment from side to side on that animal, um, as well as extending, like they say, moderately forward. Um, we have to be careful here when we start talking about those really extended foreadders. Um, is that actually productive tissue that's going forward? A lot of times we'll see these really extended foreadders having a lot of non-productive tissue there um, in the front of these foreadders. So just being mindful um, that the scorecard does only really call for a moderately extended um, foreadder and being careful as we select for these traits one of the more important traits to that four is the overall width in that lateral attachment from side to side, um, not necessarily an extreme forward, especially if that extreme forward just lends itself um, to non-productive tissue. Again, we wanna talk about um, smoothness here into that um, attachment. We don't um, want it to pull off the body, obviously, there. But what we are talking about in the smoothness um, isn't also um, an animal that just doesn't have a lot of fore udder, um, so it can be smooth on their body. So being careful there um, to recognize um, that a small udder being smooth isn't necessarily desirable because um, we do need the overall capacity into that fore udder 
um, to give us the overall productivity that we're looking for there in that manly system. When we start talking about the rear udder, again, we're seeing words such as capacious, high, wide, um, arched into that um, discussion, uniformly wide and deep um, on that mammary system, and moderately curved inside profile. So when we start breaking down this overall mammary system, again, we want to recognize that we're not talking about extremely high here. Um, we want it to have um, good height and good width but we want it to also fit within the parameters that um, we have with our rump and recognizing that our rump is one of the deciding factors here in the overall um, room we have for that family system. So when we're looking here, um, again, at that height and that width, um, we again want to see the overall proportions here to that mammary system as we start to divide it off. You should be seeing it break into these um, uniform quarters here of that mammary system. And then as we see the lines drawn here, um, the mammary system has to confine within how much width we have to the overall rump. Um, and if you picture that mammary system as it gets extremely high and extremely wide in there, um, the effect that we can start to have there in um, the use and function of the rear legs. When we talk about the um, rear udder here um, inside profile, what we're talking about um, here is the shape of it. Here we want to see it moderately curving here, um, as well as we don't want to start to see it protruding well beyond the vulva. As we have a mammary system that protrudes well beyond the vulva, you're going to start to get into a sanitation issue there, um, which again is going to lead itself to some of the um, issues we have with milk quality, um, where if you can urinate or defecate onto that mammary system, you're going to um, see that play out and keeping moisture there around those teeth that can lead itself um, to mastitis if bacteria starts to, to house there. The next part we're gonna talk about is balance, symmetry, and quality of that mammary system. We touched on it there um, briefly, where we would expect to see one third of that mammary system being the fore udder. We would expect to see one third of that mammary system being the rear udder. Um, and then you'd expect for about one third of that mammary system to be hidden here behind their rear leg. So that's the overall balance um, that we're talking about there inside profile. And on the rear, we want to see the halves being fairly uniform there. We're also talking about the quality of that mammary system, the elasticity, the um, pliability of that mammary system. This is where we have to recognize that there is going to be mammary tissue. This is a, a mammary system that has been milked down. She's a very productive doe. There is product. Um, productive mammary tissue in that mammary system. Um, sometimes we get a little bit hung up where we talk about um, the mammary system where it just drains down to a sac. Um, that's not necessarily desirable as well. There should be um, productivity when we start talking about um, the security to that mammary system. There is just tissue that is um, required for that animal to be it. More what is important is that um, tissue is pliable and has elasticity to it, um, which suggests that that's productive tissue um, as non-productive tissue. We want them to be free of um, scar tissue, obviously, in there. Um, when that tissue starts to get hard, you are going to lose out um, on productivity as well as um, as well as quality to that mammary system if there's any sort of infection going on in there. Um, there's a slide um, later here in that presentation um, that shows some of the issues you get into when you lose some of that pliability, elasticity, and overall um, quality of that uh, mammary um, tissue. Next, what we're going to talk about is teats. This is um, teats wind up just being four points on our scorecard. Um, so when we start breaking down the teats, obviously, a lot of that is going to go into the functionality of those teats. Um, a lot of us, just because it is visually um, easy to assess and um, our eye, some of it is more appealing than others, 
we get a little bit hung up on the overall t shape and size. But if we think about um, that, our scorecard just says that we want them to be proportioned in the capacity of the mammary system. And it isn't uncommon when we see um, these animals with really large mammary systems to have a little bit larger teeth. Um, when we talk about that, there isn't a ton of points um, where we get hung up on the overall teeth um, shape and size. The functionality of teeth, a large degree of teeth is um, highly functional. Um, we just need the ability for that uh, milking machine to get on um, in an efficient manner, um, drain freely. That's really what the role of these teeth are. Um, teeth placement is far more important here when we're talking about um, the functionality of those teeth. If we imagine teeth um, as they start to get to the outside um, of this mammary system away from that overall medial, um, that's when we start to see some of the problems. It's harder to get the inflations there onto that mammary system. It um, also starts to become a hazard as they start to um, rub that leg. We're going to get into the, um, that a little bit later here into that presentation. Um, but the main take home here um, is that when we're talking about the functionality of the teeth, um, teeth placement is um, heavily where we're talking about that. If we were to divide up this mammary system, um, the what we are talking about for ideal teeth placement is being about two thirds out there from the mammary system, um, having about one third of the uh, mammary system after the teeth, two thirds um, between the medial and the cheek. Um, that's what's been deemed um, fairly efficient in a parlor setting, getting the inflations on and off. Um, one of the things we don't talk about as much um, in teeth placement, though it is definitely a conversation um, in a parlor setting, especially milky from the rear, is where those teats are placed on the outer and side profile. When we have the tendency for those teats to shift forward or point forward, it is harder to gain access to those teats um, in a milking parlor situation from the rear. So just keeping that in mind, teeth placement, um, one of the more um, traits that um, we're talking about when we come down to the actual teeth of it. Um, the final product, um, using all of that on our scorecard, it should be a goat that is able to um, be um, efficient and productive for a long period of time. Um, we have a lovely example of that here in this alpine doe. Um, here we are at full maturity. We consider goats to be fully mature at four years old. Um, and we see her to continue to go on up to eight years old here, um, still being very efficient. Um, strong use of the overall feet and legs, good um, production here into the mammary system as it relates to her overall um, body capacity, um, staying in ideal um, weight here on this animal, um, and just good overall dairy form and shape. So if we follow the mammary, or if we follow the um, scorecard, it should result in an animal um, that is pretty efficient um, at their job and overall productivity with that longevity in there. Um, if you had followed along looking at some of the lines we had drawn on those animals um, as we went across, this is how all of the proportions come together into that goat. Um, from when we start talking about where the head should be proportioned um, within itself um, to where all of the body um, parts start to line up proportionally. If you were to take a um, line you should be able to fold it over on each of these points and roughly that line should be the same length as you make your way throughout the entire goat here. Um, so this is an exercise that you can do um, there on your own goats to just see how well um, the proportions of your goats are lining up. Um, you should be able to invert this line across all of these points and roughly come out the same on an animal that is considered to be um, fairly balanced and in proportion with herself. Again, I'm um, here in the rear, um, drawing that overall proportions, and again into the side profile of that mammary system. When we start breaking up the overall proportions, this is what you should see, um, with roughly the quarters all balancing out with each other um, in each of the, the scenarios there, when we're talking about an animal that has um, a proportioned mammary system to her, her overall proportion. Um, frame. So kind of a fun little exercise that you can do there with your own goats um, to just see how balanced um, they are and recognizing 
that when we start to put extremes on animals, um, we are going to have to sacrifice um, some balance in some way. Um, so this is kind of the take home message here on extremes. Um, extremes kind of can sometimes be extremely overrated. Um, I think a quote that says um, it fairly well is the best things are placed in between the extremes. Um, and that just holds true. Extremes are a great way to get animals noticed. Um, but recognize when you start dealing with an extreme, you are going to have to give up some of your overall balance. Um, and when you start giving up your overall balance, um, you are going to sacrifice somewhere probably in your um, ability to function, the longevity um, or productivity of that animal. So just recognizing that um, as the scorecard doesn't really call for extremes, it calls for an animal that's fairly balanced um, within itself. We're going to now dive into um, the importance of the rump structure and how that rump structure plays out um, to the overall um, productivity and lung um, longevity here of the mammary system and milk quality as a whole. Um, when we're talking about the rump structure and we talk about it um, basically as the garage, it's been a long time held thing going back. Um, as a lot of you probably know, um, John White or Eric Tremaine um, in the appraisal program, um, they're heavily influenced on thinking of the rump structure as a garage. Um, and so basically the little bit you get out of this mean is we're trying to fit this Mack truck into this little garage. And it's an expression um, that um, John and Eric have used a lot. There isn't a lot of ways for this to go, right? For this truck to get into that garage, um, there's only a few scenarios. One is we make this truck out of armored steel. It's really a strong truck and it forces its way into that garage. And if we think about that, um, the only scenario is we're going to blow the walls and roof off of this garage um, to get that truck into there. Much like a mammary system, if we force it into an area it doesn't fit, um, it will take its toll on the overall legs and rump structure because um, it does not fit in there. The only other thing we can do to get this truck to fit into this garage um, is to manipulate the truck in some way. We have to start crushing it down to go in there, turning it sideways, um, trying to get it to fit into an area that it doesn't fit in. We're going to see that same effect on the mammary system. Um, whereas if we don't blow the walls and roof off, we have to manipulate the mammary system in some way um, to actually get it to fit within um, the parameters there of the um, rump structure. So again, um, we'll pull up some of these same slides that we talked about here um, in that rump structure where um, we're wanting to have that width there from thorough to thorough. Um, again, the levelness inside profile and that lining up overall um, is fairly important here when we're looking here at the um, hip bones, the thorough bones and um, the pin bones. When we draw that line, um, we wanna see them kind of fall into place. As we start to see those um, proportions fall off and out of place, that's when we're going to start seeing the overall use of those legs diminish. That's when you start to see the mammary system um, getting hit repeatedly by those legs. Um, one of the telltale signs of that is if you have had a doe um, who starts out really, really capacious and you're like, oh, I love all of the milk production that I have here on that animal. And then you start to see her um, dry off on one side or dry up one of the sides more than the other. And you culture her and it comes back negative. There is no mastitis going on here. Um, she will force dry a side of her mammary system to accommodate it in a rump structure that does not fit. Um, so you start to see um, a reduction in the overall um, productivity there on that mammary system. Um, as well as you can see the mammary system um, take a shift where um, if you've heard anyone talk about um, that they have a twisted udder, um, that is usually a result of a rump structure um, that's not accommodating a mammary system that wants to fit in there. Um, it doesn't, it's traditionally a mammary system that doesn't have as strong support there into the overall um, fore udder attachment. Um, or its lateral attachments where it has the ability to shift that mammary system forward to get it out of the way of the, 
of the rear legs as she tries to walk around it. In this slide, we see an animal um, that does have thurls that are out of place. Um, they are dropped down. Again, if we were to draw that line, we'd want to see the thurls more up here in that line um, coming across from the hip bones to the thurl. When we look at this animal, um, not only are the thurls dropped here, they're also placed back. We're losing some of the overall proportion. Um, when we look, we have more than two thirds of that distance coming back to these overall thurls. So the thurls are placed back um, and down. We're starting to see the overall effect here where it starts to create an A shape. Um, we start to see the prominence of that dorsal process and then from the rear, we start to see these rear legs um, starting to turn in. We're seeing that discussion close off. This animal um, is um, in her dry period here, so we're not really seeing the ability. But if you picture um, this animal having a really wide capacious mammary system in here, you're starting to see the effects of the poor thorough placement where these legs will start to hit this um, mammary system. This is an animal um, that does exactly that in um, peak production. You do start to see her dry off one side of her mammary system um, where she cultures that she has no issue. Um, and for mastitis, she um, just naturally dries that mammary system because she does have um, strong support to that overall mammary system. The way she accommodates her um, rump shortcoming is to dry the one side slightly. Um, to accommodate and make more room for that mammary system. The next thing we're going to talk about um, as it relates to the overall um, functionality there of that mammary system is the overall teats. Um, we're talking about um, the teat placement again. We hit on it a little bit um, where as we start to get really wide on those teats, they're going to start to rub the udder or rub the legs. That's where you can start to get into a sanitation issue um, where they can get debris and dirt into that orifice if you repeatedly um, are rubbing your orifice on your legs. It also can trigger them to leak milk where it opens the orifice. Um, you'll lose some of your product on your leg. And again, an orifice that is open and leaking lends itself to mastitis. That also is largely due to um, large orifices that will um, compact, just compound the issue even more where um, more debris can get in there um, leading to that issue. We also um, start talking about the security of the mammary system again. If we start to lose some of that support, the medial support, um, the lateral attachment support, we have a mammary system that starts to fall um, from that um, animal where it gets lower, closer to the ground. Again, we're going to be able to have um, it uh, get um, dirt and debris getting onto that mammary system easier. It starts to get hit by the legs as the animal starts to um, get up and down. They can step on that mammary system, um, doing damage to the overall mammary system. So support is definitely um, a strong um, thing to keep in mind when we're talking about the overall quality um, of your end product. And then um, gland emptying, again, um, we want that tissue to be productive tissue. We don't want to see a lot of scar tissue in there. And then orifices being too tight. Um, we start to get into the other issue there. Um, when we have an orifice that is too tight, it takes longer to milk them out there on the machine. That will start to do damage to the overall um, orifice. We have a slide here um, on that. This is a great resource if you want to um, draw it down or you just want to um, search. It's the TN Condition Scorecard. Um, it's put out by um, the um, Minnesota um, uh, University of Minnesota Extension. Um, it's a great resource and tool for just scoring your TN. Um, which can be a very effective um, method. It can um, tell you things. If you're seeing um, a lot of orifice damage um, here where you're starting to score um, into the twos, threes, and even these fours that are pretty severe, um, and then there is also a five um, on that scorecard if you go and look. Um, but you're starting to see a lot of damage to your cheek, and this is where bacteria can be housed, um, lending itself to mastitis. Um, so just recognizing if you're getting a lot of them in your herd, that could suggest another um, issue with your overall uh, milking process. Um, but if it's an individual case 
um, where you have an animal taking a very long time um, to milk out, where we're starting to see some of the damage to those teeth ends that can lend itself to mastitis. That's where um, you will want to select um, to mate her in the future to animals that have a little bit um, more open orifices there, um, where you can avoid some of that issue um, just with your overall orifice size. When we're talking about um, medial and teat placement, um, you'll sometimes hear people say where if they had a stronger medial, their teat placement um, would be better. That can be the case. This um, doe here, this black doe, um, is an example of that. When we look at her overall medial, we don't really see the really strong medial coming in here, the overall support. Um, she has a small cleft here, but not really as strong as cleft is what you would see. And you start to see her um, with outside teeth here. If this medial was stronger where you could picture starting to pull this whole mammary system up, you'd naturally start to see these teeth come in just a little bit. Um, whereas this doe on this side, um, she is a great example of a mammary system where this the teeth placement is the overall issue. We now have gotten teeth that are so far to the outside, um, we start to see their uh, mammary being lower here, where um, the floor of the mammary system is actually lower to the opening of those teeth. This mammary system can no longer drain um, freely. It's starting to actually impede the overall function. Besides um, having the ability that these teeth now rub those legs, triggering it um, to lose milk and or um, getting um, interfering here with the leg where we get debris on there, these teeth have just gotten too wide and it has nothing to do with the overall use of the um, um, ligament here. The medial is strong on this dough. You can see it in the back and you can see it in the cleft. This is just a case where the teeth placement is not desirable um, on this am animal as compared to an animal that could benefit just from having um, a little bit more medial here on this side. This is a good example of why we don't want scar tissue into that mammary system. This is an animal that has a lot of scarring. Um, you can see the lumps and bumps here throughout into that mammary system. This is what we're talking about, um, poor texture overall to that mammary system. We don't have the pliability or the elasticity to that mammary system, the, un the unability for that mammary system to milk down. And we just start off um, right out the gate losing a lot of productivity. This is an um, animal, again, that with all of that scar tissue um, was a mastitis issue, um, leaning itself to, again, a reduction there in your overall productivity. Um, so just a good example of why we care about um, the texture there of that mammary system and having that correct um, pliability um, to that mammary system. Um, so again, um, when we're talking about the general appearance and the movement of that animal, that comes into play. Um, when we talked about the um, front end structure, the rump structure, the use of those legs, we need those animals um, to be able to get up and down, move about. Um, stationary animals um, does not go well for the animal. We see the effect not only on that they're down, laying down more, um, where their mammary system is in the dirt, in the um, bedding, where you can get an increased um, mastitis risk there. Um, but also you start to see the animal um, then increasing in its overall body condition. We're not exercising as much. We're not using our feet and legs as much. When you start to get animals that are more heavy and more um, stationary animals, you start to lose out um, on um, some of the um, breeding ability, animals that carry a lot of extra weight um, traditionally don't rebreed as well. That in turn, you're going to um, have lower um, productivity and just um, utter health in general. So just recognizing um, the importance that good general appearance can play there and the overall um, movement and ability for those animals to milk. Again, we need them to be able to come in. We need them to be able to get onto that parlor line. We need them to be able to stand there comfortably um, without shifting their weight back and forth, knocking inflations off. Um, that's a large part of their job. So just recognizing um, that that plays an important role or important role in your uh, milk um, production and um, 
quality of that milk product, just in the ability for that animal to move around, getting up and out of that um, bedding, in and out of the milk parlor in an efficient um, manner. So as stewards, um, all of I encourage all of us um, to do good breeding of good type. Um, as we're putting these animals out, we need to think about um, the how important it is um, for a good type, not just so that we have animals that live longer, that they're more productive having these lifespans. Um, but as we focus on that good type, there's less need for the medical um, intervention. You're gonna just then in turn see that increased, um, not only um, productivity, but the overall quality there of your in product. So um, super important as we're going forward with our breeding animals, especially any of us um, that send animals into um, dairies and those kind of environments, um, just really being mindful um, of what the function of the dairy goat is um, and the function um, coming down to that scorecard, that long and productive lifespan. We want those animals that are efficient for a long and um, productive time. Um, these are the references here for that talk. A lot of this came from the linear appraisal system, um, the blue book, um, as we call it, for the American Dairy Goat Association, obviously um, heavily related here to the ABGA scorecard. Um, I have to give a shout out to um, Trinity Smith Malmanis of Goats and Dairy Goats in California. Um, a lot of this was taken from her talk um, back when I um, did this presentation in Iowa um, late fall, um, she was supposed to um, be there. She had a conflict, asked me to step in. Um, so a lot of this was taken from her. Um, and then um, that's also why you see a bunch of the photo credits going to her. Um, the La Manchas are obviously hers, some of the Nubians hers, um, and then some of the Nubians obviously Irish as well. Um, so I guess at this point, um, do we have any um, questions about any of this? Um, well, thanks, Danny, for um, giving all this great information. I think you really tied it really well with the, the scorecard and then, you know, the practical application of, you know, our commercial and, and uh, show dairy goat herds where we can really about start to evaluate um, our herds for productivity because at the end of the day that's our goal is to have healthy productive animals and if we can start to take a look at this I think that becomes very beneficial to our herds. Um, so we'll, we'll take any questions in the chat so go ahead and put those in there as we're taking those. Um, I was just wondering about breed differ differences with the proportion of the lines, do you notice any differences in breed or is it, would you consider them all to be kind of similar? So um, with the American Dairy Goat Association, we say that we have a uniform um, scorecard and by that it's um, uniformed across all breeds. So we would expect for the proportions to be um, roughly the same. The only um, caveat that I will say to that um, is there's a lot of discussion about the uh, Nigerian dwarf um, breed. And um, right now, as it stands, we do expect to see the same proportions and balance um, there. Um, it is a little bit harder for them to, um, to get to it as they are the newest breed or one of the newer breeds here in the American Dairy Goat Association. Um, so um, there's a long-standing thing that since they are a miniature breed, um, can we really expect them to have the same proportions? But as it stands right now, um, what we know in dairy goats, we expect all breeds um, to adhere to the same kind of balance and proportions. Um, the main differences we see between breeds is basically um, stature. Um, some of them are naturally taller than others. Um, but we have tried to kind of move a little bit away from that where um, besides into the breed character, um, where some of them are moderate breeds, some of them are um, taller breeds, um, the proportion and balance you should still roughly see across all breeds um, where it lends itself um, to the more correct type um, and balance of that animal to follow those proportions. Okay, we've got a question that says, uh, when negative traits, have you found the most quickly improve one in one generation? Okay, <laughs> so that, that all is a, a loaded question there. Um, so that starts to come down to um, prepotency of your animals. Um, there is animals that are very prepotent for 
um, passing on trait. And that is good and bad. So um, it is completely possible to change any trait in one generation. Um, but it also is completely possible to not, depending on how prepotent that animal is for passing on um, that genetics. Traditionally, where you need to look, um, let's take um, teeth placement um, for, for an example. Um, when we're talking about really wide um, teeth there, um, if we have seen that generation after generation um, where the dam, the grand dam, and now the daughter and her um, new daughter all have um, outside teeth, that's going to be a harder um, trait to break as opposed to an animal um, that she's first generation with wider teeth, but her dam and her grand dam before her um, did not. They had more correct teeth placement. You'll traditionally see those animals um, coming to the more correct form quicker. Um, so it really does depend on how, um, how many generations you're dealing with that problem and um, how prepotent the animals are for that trait. We talk about, um, uh, you'll hear people say like, and he's an utter butt, um, where um, he changes a lot of the utter traits and he's pretty potent for those um, in his daughters. So it's kind of, um, that's another great tool of the linear appraisal program um, and the type evaluations of animals you're able to go on there. Um, and that is going to tell you how prepotent a lot of those animals are. It'll tell you um, where that buck um, is, um, what percent of reliability he passes on those traits. So those are kind of important things to think of when you're um, thinking of correcting those is how many generations it's been an issue in those lines. Um, that'll kind of tell you how quickly that is going to um, come or go in, in the future offspring. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah. Uh, John has another question. Mm -hmm. uh, commented in the last photograph, the second goat from the left appears to have four ears, two down, two up. Is yes. that correct? Or is that just a fun photograph? <laughs> no, it's just a fun photo. Um, it's actually a baby son and I'm standing behind her, but it looks like she's wearing um, wearing bunny ears. Yes, but <laughs> uh, but it, the little Nubians all lined up across the, the gate and the poor son and had to stand in the back and she just um, perfectly stood there to give um, give the bunny ears approach to the the other baby. <laughs> so. Okay, so. now that was kind of fun. It is uh, kind of fun, yeah. Mm. I've got a question. As I look at other species, I see our scorecards change as productivity trait research is done. Are we in the position where that may happen with our, our dairy goat scorecard? Yes, so um, it is an ever evolving um, document. Um, it actually, um, there used to be points for stature um, in our scorecard. Um, they were removed, um, it's been a few years now. Um, it was removed with the basis that um, with our um, research and development that we have found in the linear appraisal program, um, we saw no benefit to um, productivity or longevity based with stature, um, that more of what was coming down to it was the overall balance and proportion of the dairy goat. Um, so if you're going to be small, be small, but be in balance. If you're going to be large, be large, um, but be in balance with yourself. Um, and so the balance played far more role. So we did remove the stature to the scorecard. Um, we are currently discussing... Um, if we should be breaking down um, the legs, pasture, and feet um, part of the scorecard to give that a little bit more definition of where those points should go. So it is an ever-evolving um, document. Um, as we gain more information and as we have more data to make some of these changes, um, we, we do go for it. Um, the point of the scorecard, again, um, is to have that long and productive life. So if um, we get more information as we go along that lends itself to making more productive and long living animals. Um, we are game for, um, for changing it. It goes through um, the type committee um, and then um, gets referenced out to a few other committees just to make sure um, there isn't radical changes um, that weren't thought out. But yeah, there is a process um, that we are ever evolving that scorecard as we learn more about Perry Go.
I've got one more question of my own as I was thinking through this. Okay. We were talking breeds. What about the crossbreeds in our industry? Do they uh, fit the same way? Yep. So they're handled the, the same exact way. Um, in the American Dairy Goat Association, um, we do register the experimentals or the recorded grapes, which are um, a mix of the breeds. Um, and they are handled the exact same way. They're evaluated the same way um, with that same scorecard. So, yep, all of the, um, the mixed breeds. There's a couple um, of um, fun breeders out there that solely um, breed. Um, crossbred animals because that's their impression is they take the best from um, every breed and put it together into one. And um, in a dairy setting, um, there is a lot of um, lot of benefits to the um, crossbreeding and just taking the positive traits from each of the breeds and putting them in there. So um, definitely encouraged and allowed by the scorecard. Fred, Fred, I'm not seeing any additional questions. So I think um, we'll wrap up the webinar from here. Again, thank you, Daniel, for being yes. on our webinar thank series. You. And we look forward to um, seeing the group again. Um, again, we're going to have our next webinar on May 22nd, as we talk about biosecurity before we um, start hitting the summertime fairs. So uh, we'll look forward to seeing you then. Thank you. All right. Thank you.